Welcome to Ausfilm Creatives, a podcast about Australian creatives working behind the camera. My name is Peter Sylvester and I'm your host. Welcome back everyone and hopefully you're staying safe and uh, you've been um, all right going with the lockdowns of the uh, COVID virus and um, we're probably getting to a period where uh, things are starting to get back to normal in Australia which is quite exciting for us filmmakers and this episode we have Stefan Duccio who's a more recent up-and-coming cinematographer but he's already produced some wonderful pieces of work and uh, one of the more recent ones is The Invisible Man, which we'll talk about in detail. And he also shot Upgrade and Jungle. And he's um, even worked with uh, Beyonce on two music clips, which is pretty cool. And so, yeah, let's uh, have a listen to what he has to say. Welcome to the uh, show, Stefan. It's amazing. Uh, you've got a nice body of work and the most recent film. Hopefully it's done well before all this virus issue with the Invisible Man. So I really hope you guys have succeeded with it because I, I got to see it and it was a brilliant little horror thriller kind of. I'd probably more put it as a thriller than a horror the way I, you know, experienced it. But it's a great, great little film. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd love to find out a little bit about how you fell in love with filmmaking and I guess the sort of how you, how you got into it. Cool. Thanks for having me, Peter. Um, yeah, I grew up in a small country town in country Victoria called Cobram, and I grew up wanting to be a writer and an illustrator. You know, I loved comic books, animation, uh, did love films, but, you know, I had a deep love for comics and animation. And so eventually, um, you know, I made a couple of short films in high school, like made a little mafia film and. Lego stop motion mm. animation and that kind of thing. But when I got to university in Melbourne, I studied media arts at RMIT and I started studying more animation, uh, a little bit of film theory, um, uh, digital imaging for photography, some fine art printing, kind of was dabbling in a lot of different mediums. Um, and it wasn't until after I finished university and I started working many different vocations to try everything out that I started taking the possibility of film a little bit more seriously you know it was a bit of a slow to burn it took me about you know five or six years after university to really start committing myself to it because I found it a pretty daunting industry to step into especially when I wasn't formally trained mm. per se it wasn't really a film school that I went to it was more of an art school yeah. And how, how come you ended up choosing to be a DP? What was sort of that path for you? Um, it was a series of many, many life experiences, I guess, over those few years. Like I, after uni, I worked as a storyboard artist with directors. Um, I worked as a graphic designer for DVDs, doing their covers and menus. And um, I was assisting fashion photographers. I was assisting some DPs, you know, I was doing a lot of volunteer work with DPs like Greg Fraser and Jermaine McMicking to try and learn from people like that. And I slowly started crossing off all those other career options, I guess, as I started to fall more and more in love with film and it became slightly more familiar. Um, yeah, because at first I was terrified of it and yeah, it took me a few years as well as volunteering at VCA Film School, shooting some student films there that, um, you know, brought my confidence up and, you know, gave me the cadence to commit to it a bit more. And was there something that uh, helped you to kick off the career as a DP, or like the piece of work that pushed you forward or, or someone mentor or, yeah? Um, not, not a single piece of... Um, not a single event, many, many events over years, I feel like, you know, chance meetings with people like Andrew Lesney and Greg Fraser and Jermaine McMicking and then meeting people like Ari Wegner and Adam Arkapoor at VCA, you know, when I was volunteering to work on student films there. Um, you know, all, all these experiences add up to, you know, create a body of work and create a discipline and you sort of um, 
learn what you can from people and learn what you don't want to be from some people as well. That can also be valuable too. Like maybe I had some experiences with some film crews where I was like, oh, I don't want to do that if I ever am lucky enough to DP or direct or whatever. Um, yeah, so it's all a big, it's an accumulation, I think. And I, and I never really had a breakout project in a way. I've sort of just been slogging away at it. Like all through my 20s, I was making short films and music videos and which I'll, which led on to some commercial work and yeah it just kept getting bigger and bigger consistency is the biggest key really in filmmaking you know producing content as much as you can and getting out there and making it i mean some people get that that magic dream lucky break um but some you know like most of us i'd say it's the ones that just keep going and slug away the years years and years away so yeah yeah so when you got your first uh, feature film, how did, how did that happen? That, that was sort of a slow growth of like smaller features into bigger features. One of the first features, if you can call it that, was a, a small film I did in Beijing uh, with some ex-VCA students that had gotten together some money in China after having worked on some films over there and, you know, they invited me to come across and shoot this film. You know, it was probably six weeks of pre and the shoot all in one, but it was such a um, seminal experience in my life. Like it was, you know, full of travel and adventure and filmmaking and, you know, crazy stories and, you know, bonding with crew that the film didn't turn out that great, but the experience of making it was, was amazing and um, had a, had a great influence on me and, um, you know, sparked the sense of adventure that filmmaking can be. Mm. Um, you know, that led on to another film that I did uh, called uh, Canopy with uh, a director called Aaron Wilson, uh, mm. which was a film set in World War II in Singapore about an Australian soldier who crash lands there. And uh, I think we might have done that in about 2010. Mm. Um, yeah, so I got to see that one. It was great. Oh, great. And that was one of the first, you know, shot that on the first red one camera, uh -huh. um, which was fun. And, you know, it was fun working in Singapore, um, you know, they, in what they do have a small jungle there, believe it or not. There's so much city, but we, you know, we're in this amazing lush jungle where we were shooting. Um, and then that led on to uh, kind of this very different from the last two films, this big romantic comedy with uh, working dog productions called Any Questions for Ben, mm. which was fun. I knew the working dog crew from um, doing a, a TV series on the ABC with them called The Hollow Men, which oh, yes. is a yep. very funny uh, you know, political comedy, mm. and that led on to them offering me uh, you know, the DP role on Any Questions for Ben, which was you know, a massive opportunity for me when I think I think I was 27 at the time wow. doing a, you know, pretty big, big budget feature film, um, you know, two cameras, 35 mil all over my hometown of Melbourne. Um, you know, I think the shoot might have been eight weeks long. It's probably still one of the longest feature film shoots I've ever done. Um, you know, it was a lot of fun. It was great to shoot a lot of film as well, like, you know, hundreds of thousands of feet of film to get that muscle going in my head. Wow, and it's still still on film. Um, yeah, it's 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 kind of a surprise anything post two thousand ten that people are still shooting on film and on well, for your from your perspective it was probably a large budget, but for Australian standards, I mean for international standards it's pretty low budget. So it's still it's, Yeah, exactly. It's these days it's a interesting to hear that you can still shoot on film i mean i you know i i i've never got to shoot narrative on film i start learned and studied on it and yeah it must be fantastic to shoot on film still um yeah i would love to shoot on it again i mean i've tried to get recent productions to shoot shoot on it or consider it but um it's very hard in australia to convince mm -hmm. producers in particular line producers to entertain the idea of film unfortunately you know, a lot of directors and DPs still want to shoot film, but that decision was taken away from us um, by by people who really shouldn't be um, 
as involved in the decision as they should be. Like it mm. should be a sure it absolutely costs more uh, more money, but um, that decision uh, I'm, I'm, I feel like we gave up on it way too fast in Australia. Whereas as you know, many other countries are still shooting on it. Many of the my favourite directors are all still shooting on film. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying it's right for every every project, but mm. You know, it might be right one in five, you know, yes. it demands a look like that, you know, and, um, yeah, it's a shame we don't have that option anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. I think you can still do it on a budget. Like, you know, first thing that comes to mind is like someone like Clint Eastwood, you know, it's, he, he, wants, he wants to do every, every scene, every shot in two takes at most. So, you know, if you go with that kind of economy and really get the actors to just, you know, be ready to go, everyone ready to go, not just the actors, the crew, to knock it out in two shots. You could do it on a on a budget, if you know what I mean. So there's still ways to do it. But like you said, it's just people that make the decisions don't understand necessarily that that's a way to do it. They probably are too used to the idea of, oh, well, on digital you can do 20 takes, you know. <laughs> yeah, and you, you really need the director to come on board with you on that battle mm. as well because I've fought for it on films in the past but without the full support of a director that you, you, mm. you can only, the DP can only kick and scream so much before, you know, ideally you're working with a director who's had experience in the discipline of shooting film. And so it doesn't shock them to mm. think about things like ratios or um, rehearsing more. Um, but probably the last project I did on film was maybe two years ago and it was a 16 mil commercial uh, in Victoria and it was amazing how fast all the crew settled back into that discipline. It was mm. quite, you know, everyone sort of built it up as how are we going to remember how to do this? <laughs> but after like half an hour, everyone was like, cool, we remember, we got this. It was like riding a bike again. And, um, you know, it's quite efficient. Everyone's quite focused, of course, when you roll more and, yeah. um, you know, it's a bit more hallowed when you hit yeah. roll. I think it becomes uh, more of a synchronous performance by everyone rather than almost a little bit can be a little bit passive with digital where you know yeah uh, yep, i can see the image all good oh, i gotta you know follow the action but all good you know you don't I, the pressure is on so that's that's the beauty of it that you actually are forced to perform from you know from everyone that's you know went as soon as the camera rolls yeah so you've obviously had a good experience shooting uh, features and, and music clips. Is there any, any technique that you, you approach a script when you receive one? Uh, as far as how, do you, are you one of those where you just read the script at first or are you full on straight into and start taking notes? And, or is there like a certain approach you like to do when you receive a new script? No, I think I'm pretty story driven when I first read something. Uh, when I first read something, it's all about whether the story affected me or whether I'm emotionally connected with the material. Um, I, I tend not to think of it logistically at all when I first read it, even the second time, uh, you know, it takes me, you know, I might just start to think of logistics then or, you know, visuals. But, yeah, it's a pretty um, slow process for me, breaking down a script and imagining what, is possible to do with it visually. You know, I often struggle with directors who want immediate feedback on the script and like want me to start pitching visuals to them or visual style uh, because it does take me a while to unpack it. And I also want to hear from directors more than anything about what they saw in it first before I start imprinting anything on top of that. Um, yeah, my note taking processes you know, a little bit OCD these days. I <laughs> find scripts a really ambiguous document, um, an ambiguous blueprint for a film. So I sort of tend to make infographics and spreadsheets and breakdowns of scripts to try and break it down visually in a way. I go, you know, what's the percentage of interior versus exterior or how many, what, where is most of the film set? Is it in this house or is it in this exterior location? And so I try and break it down, almost colour-coded visuals to go and put it on a wall, um, you know, if I've got time. And that, that I find that really helpful these days. 
just the act of breaking it down helps you understand the film more as well, even if it's even if that end document isn't that useful to anybody else. It is to me because I, you know, go through the film with a fine tooth comb. Mm. Oh, I think it's important. I mean, preparation on all aspects is important as a general statement. But yeah, it's. Um, do you find um, that, that you've received scripts with a storyboard already ready to go, or is that not really been your experience? Not in my experience. Often, um, the storyboarding on films that I'm on anyway happens once I'm on board. Um, yeah, and, and ideally, I like to be involved in that with the director and the storyboard artist. Um, yeah, obviously, that would happen in the commercial world where you're on the job a little bit later and mm -hmm. boards might come in, um, you know, what, before you're there. Uh, but certainly in, a, in features, yeah, love being involved in that process. Mm, yeah, it's good if you can. And um, yeah, I've, I've kind of been somewhat lucky of one aspect that I've worked with directors that generally have like they're keen to have a very strong visual and they they kind of know exactly what needs to be on board and like i don't know if you've seen ben hall but the, the director matt he um he storyboarded all himself so he knew exactly the vi visual style he wanted so that was very easy to work with um but right. on, but on the other hand yeah I've, I've made shorts where it's like you rock up on or you try to draw it out of the director to sit down and do short list and they kind of do it on the on the day <laughs> so it's you get the two extremes sometimes yeah yeah so let's look at maybe the one of your most recent uh work which is the invisible man so talking about your breaking down um what was sort of your approach and visual styles that that you and uh lee wanted to kind of bring through the, the film uh one of the key things about the Invisible Man was that Lee, um, he, he first and foremost wanted to scare the hell out of people in that film and create a, a huge feeling of unease mm. and tension throughout. And, you know, him being the writer, he also had some very strong visual ideas on the film early on because he'd been thinking about it for so long. And one of the things uh, he pressed upon me was, uh, he wanted it to be a horror film with the lights on because even with the lights on in that space, it doesn't make you any safer because mm. who knows if somebody is in that room or not. Mm. Um, and also the idea of uh, unmotivated camera movement. So that means, you know, if we're, if the camera might be on our, um, you know, lead actress, uh, Elizabeth Moss playing Cecilia, we might be on Cecilia and the camera might pan away from her mm. in a completely unmotivated way and land in a corner of the house that suggests someone may be there. Mm. And uh, we loved that idea because we felt if we did it enough times, it would create this relentless tension in the film, this feeling of unease. And it was also quite playful because it suggests the camera knows more about what's happening in this space than uh, our character does. Mm. And it knows more about what's happening in this space than the audience does. So it's almost like making the camera a character. And that's the fun thing about thrillers and horrors is that you can uh, have very playful camera movement and very suggestive camera movement. Um, you know, Lee screened Hereditary uh, to the cast and crew before we shot the film mm. at one point because again the camera movement in that film is incredible and very creative mm. very suggestive um yeah early on lee and i you know like to watch a lot of films together whether they're relevant or not but just to suggest just to um be inspired by great filmmakers nice yeah the um uh, i think that would that, that kind of camera move that that you know like you said unmo unmotivated you know huge amount of extra negative space effect as well that's the other thing i noticed that that worked really well before um before the invisible man was let to let known to the audience that he's there or not um so without giving spoilers <laughs> but you know like that was that was a uh, that worked really effective the f in especially in the first act where you guys started doing that um 
because uh, yeah i was uh, yeah it definitely had that real tension where i was like oh this is really dreary and obviously the idea of the character of, of what she what, what why she's scared as well that made it even worse uh of the situation that you guys created this you know you didn't it wasn't shown at the start of the film at all whether there was an abusive relationship or not but you know she's that's what she's escaping from and so that already added that extra pressure as well i think with the with those you know camera moves and that um so when you guys actually went on to or you know, for you especially with lighting um like you said you wanted to do daytime which yeah like you said it was completely effective because he's the invisible man um what what were some of your stars i mean i noticed you had quite uh, you know, deeper oranges uh, for your for your lamps, I guess. And you actually, interestingly, hopefully, it's my screen was calibrated right, but it, it looked more blue than than the usual, you know, orange and teal that that a lot of modern films have done as far as moonlight, which I I really liked because I was like, you know, even like um, Terminator Two, the older film, I love that really strong blues rather than going towards a till so yeah that was great but what was the thoughts behind that as far as you're lighting the houses uh, or house and and um and i guess the difference once you you went outside of the house was there any differences you de- you decided to go with as far as a look well to, to hit those sort of blues yeah i tend to keep that quite subtle in camera like mm. you know my color temperatures are only slightly cooler and knowing that you know i might in the DI find that exact, you know, blue or teal, like you say, uh, with a colorist because um, I don't like uh, the, the LUT that I kind of use um, on, the, on the Alexa, which is what we shot on, uh, is quite simple and I just use one LUT on the whole film. Mm. Um, you know, and I might have shot, uh, you know, 4,300 Kelvin, for example, for Moonlight and set or you know all my all my lights to either be hmis or sky panels at 5600 kelvin so they're kind of like a half blue um i don't tend to gel them too much or do anything and i wanted yeah moonlight's a really important um aesthetic for dps as you know it's like kind of where you find out what you're made of in a way because you start with such a blank canvas Mm. and you can either make it look really fake or hopefully more subtle and realistic as a moonlight. And um, I work really hard on that um, and I'm really picky about moonlight and I never feel ultimately happy with it. One day I really hope I can light moonlight how I really want to, but it's often you're achieving so many setups on those nights and moving the camera around so much. Mm. It's very hard to shape moonlight in a realistic way all the time. Yeah. But... um. Yeah, like like lighting, lighting that moonlight color. Um, yeah, it's an ongoing, ongoing <laughs> mental battle for me. Every film, I get slightly better at doing it. Yeah, it's tricky because moon, moonlight, like, um, you know, it's a, it, it's a perceived reality though. Like people think if you were to moonlight for as moonlight is, then it might not look right on camera. You know what I mean? Like, it's a, it's a exactly funny thing. yeah. Moonlight is so hard uh, as a as a light source. It's so far away and so small that it creates such hard shadows. It's very theatrical and mm. it's very bright. If you're in, you know, away from a city and you're in a full moon, you can see for miles and miles. Whereas, you know, if we lit like that, you know, people would think we're crazy. So you're kind of lighting scenes as to your memory or your interpretation of moonlight. It's usually softer um and uh it, it's often something uh there's a lot of discussions with about directors because directors often want it darker and i find i often want it you know brighter on the day to be mm. able to bring down in the di just to avoid noise mm. but um it, you know people kind of get in what watching these things in the dark on set with really vivid bright monitors and they're wanting it to be very dark, which mm. I'm totally into. I love dark images, but um, 
yeah, often I need to like bring the director in to see the DIT at the end of the day and show them what it can ultimately look like yeah. once we bring it down and to get them to trust the light levels that I'm lighting to. Yeah. And with, uh, I, I also noticed, I don't know if this was visual effects or not, but like there was a lot of almost 360 kind of camera work. Was, was it all kind of top lit or did you actually have lights on the side and then just digitally removed? Cause... No. Um, if, if you're talking about a lot of the steady cam work inside the houses, yeah. then most of that was all, yeah, long steady cam takes and, um, you know, hiding lights everywhere. We didn't mm. remove any lights digitally oh, um good. so yeah they're often quite big lighting setups to be able to walk from one end of a house to the other you know keep it dark and moody yet be able to see the detail on cecilia's face for all the marks that she's going to hit um you know i often walk around the set for you know after i've figured out the move with the director and steady cam operator um you know i might walk around that set for an hour with the gaffer just um, setting all those lights so they're hidden mm. and also so they we, we make sure we can see the actor at the key moments. But, um, yeah, you're working at really low light levels for all that stuff and doing very subtle, subtle things. Mm. Great. Uh, with the uh, her, her and her husband's house, was that... Um, like a, a set with green screen or would you actually have a location where you could see the water in the background? Yeah, we did have that as a real location. Um, you know, we looked for that location for weeks in pre-production mm. and we ultimately created Adrian's house, the Invisible Man's house, out of four separate locations um, in and around Sydney. Um, you know, we had an exterior in, in one town. We had the interior in another town. Uh, you know, we had the bedroom um, in Sydney and we had his lab in Sydney and, you know, we kind of joined them via fantastic production design by Alex Holmes, you know, where he was able to give them all a similar feel. Uh, we used this sort of LED strip lighting throughout all those locations to make them feel seamless. And a couple of them also both had views of the ocean. Three of those locations had views of the ocean. And so what we endeavoured to do was rather than shooting night for night, which was often scripted as night scenes at that house, um, I encouraged us to shoot dusk for night uh, for a few key sequences so we could see the ocean out those windows. Otherwise, those windows would have just been a mirror and we would have lost so much of what made those locations spectacular, which mm. is huge horizon line ocean out the window um and you know it's stressful trying to achieve big scenes at, mm. at dusk because you know you've got really 10 minutes of good light i i find to get that exposure looking realistic maybe 15 mm. um where it should look like it's the middle of the night but you do have you do need enough ambience in the sky to light the ocean mm. no, that and, looks uh, fantastic. Yeah, I'm really happy with it, and I think it was worth pushing for. Um, otherwise, it could have been like, why are we at these locations? You could have been in a set, you know. Mm. Or... Yeah, well, that, that's why I asked because I thought, oh, I'm sure that that's legit. It looked legit to me, but I was just like, you never know these days, but that's good to hear that you managed to do it all and through that trickery of doing dust shooting. But, yeah, it's, uh, you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself too, so... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, if you get the director on board and you get them to agree at, that it's an, that it's important to the movie, then you go to the cast in a way and go, okay, is the other cast, are you guys happy to do a couple of wide masters of this scene at dusk? You know, you've, we can't stop for, like, direction or chats or anything. You've got to have all those chats beforehand. Yeah. You know, you've got to get the first AD, everyone on board, all the technical crew have to understand how important hitting that dusk window is and you know often everyone gets excited about that and is up for the challenge and um you know we had a fantastic crew who loved those challenges and we we had to hit them a few times on this shoot and moving towards uh the other location that i i thought was well played out was the 
the mental institution or prison, however you want to call it. Um, yeah, that, that especially that scene where there's a big battle scene between her and an invisible man and a heap of cops. Like, how, how was that quite challenging to try and make sure that it works visually? Um, because I'm assuming you would have had like a guy in a green green suit or something to to achieve that, but to to know that that actually is going to work, like, was that a bit scary? <laughs> Yeah, are you talking about the one in the corridor? Yes, yeah, the long corridor and she's on the ground. And Yeah, so that um, scene was achieved via motion control, which we used the most, an Argo motion control robot many times in the film and that um, I'd worked with a few times before The Invisible Man um, on some commercials uh, and Harry Duck and Alice is a stunt coordinator in Sydney that I've worked with a lot and he... Uh, runs D1 Studios in Marrickville and also owns the Argo motion control robot. So I introduced him to uh, our producer Kylie and director Lee and suggested Harry would be great to come on board because he'd be a bit of a triple threat in a way. He could be the stunt coordinator of the film, help manage the motion control robot, do rehearsals in his studio. Um, you know, and once we found that location, for, you know, the psychiatric ward. Uh, Harry taped up the dimensions of that corridor in his studio and rehearsed it with a stunt crew for weeks to figure out that sequence. Um, Lee wanted it to feel like a seamless one-shot take Mm. and initially it was going to be one shot on the motion control uh, rig, but Harry encouraged us to break it up so he could do more spectacular, uh, you know, attacks with the Invisible Man and and the guards. Uh, in the fe- in the final film, it looks like one scene was shot because mm. you know, obviously, when you break up the motion control, the end frame of one pass can perfectly match up to the start frame of another pass. So, you know, it might have been six different uh, passes, but it looks like one shot. Um, And that was a lot of back and forth with Harry and Chris Weir, the fight coordinator, who Lee and I had worked with on Upgrade, and, uh, you know, just back and forth about how we wanted the fight to be and making sure it still felt like it was part of our movie and our visual language because the temptation at first was to make it quite big and almost Marvel in a way. and Invisible Man was more powerful than he should have been, but we all kind of just tempered it back, tempered the camera moves back a bit, so it still felt part of our yeah, part of our language. Yeah, well, that, that one that scene easily could have come come off as a Marvel thing, but I think you guys managed to make it just just enough that if someone can't see you and you're kicking the crap out of them, well, it's easy. You're an easy target. Um, so yeah. it, it made sense. It didn't feel over the top, and 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 there was guns involved. So as soon as you throw guns in a situation, well, it's pretty lethal anyway. <laughs> so it made yep. sense. But if he wouldn't have had the guns, maybe that might have not sold it enough. That he's oh, he can just kick the crap out of people too easily. So no, it's good. <laughs> it worked really well. And and lighting that scene, I guess, it must have been just. Uh, is that was that a stage? Uh, no, that that was a real location in, in north of Sydney. Yeah. Oh wow! So yeah, so with lighting, you kind of just worked with um, putting uh, top lights, I guess, because I'm trying to remember the scene. It was fairly high ceiling. Um, it was yeah, the ceilings were kind of high, and um, in when we got there, it was, it's basically an abandoned pharmaceutical building, and a lot of the lighting in it no longer worked. So, you know, with my gaffer Matt Hoyle, him and another electrician decided to put in very high powered. Uh, high bay leds so they're quite industrial and bright Mm. and sharp quality of light um but i love the quality of that source it's sort of like a a, you know very lee wanted a really bright look in there Mm. um like it would hurt her eyes when she comes in uh so it was you know kind of simple in a way lighting that once the electrical work was done we just had some little side lights through other other rooms and Mm. away we went I couldn't help thinking it's it's not a negative statement towards the movie, but it's a bit of an homage to Terminator 2, the escape scene. It just oh, gave yeah. me a little inkling of that. I'm like, that's cool. But it, it didn't feel like it was a copy or anything. It was just the first thing yep. that came to mind because, uh, yeah, obviously a lot of people's 
favourite movies or one of favourite movies, Terminator 2, so can't help thinking. Oh, that. no. Lee and I love it. And uh, Lee, I mean, Lee screened Terminator 1 to the cast and crew of Upgrade that we did in Melbourne. So, yeah, he loves it as well. Yeah. That, that, from working uh, Lee with second, uh, the second time or did you work any other time with him? I I met Lee on a film called The Mule, uh, <clears throat> which was, you know, this crime caper that we shot in Melbourne in, I think, 2014. Uh, I haven't seen that. Uh, and, and he co-wrote that with Angus Sampson, um, one of his oldest friends. And after I did The Mule, he, he offered me Upgrade, which we worked on together. That was the first time I'd worked with him as a director. Yeah, you guys went all balls out with that and with the camera work and things like that. Yeah. There's some really cool stuff in it and worked really well. And I sh- did you use a bit of uh, motion control in that as well? Or? We didn't. We didn't. Oh, um, wow. In, in Upgrade, we uh, used – I worked with a, a good friend of mine, Andrew Johnson, AJ, Steadicam operator, and um, we'd been talking before Upgrade about this uh, technique where – uh, you can roll the camera and lock it to a subject. Um, oh, yes. You know, I'd done a bit of work in commercials where I was manually doing it with like a weaver head, mm. rolling the camera in timing it to Olympians. And around that same time, AJ had his Omega AR rig upgraded to be able to uh, track to iPhones and Apple Watches. Oh. So, he, you know, once Lee started encouraging us to figure out cool uh, – you know, camera moves to do an upgrade. We started rehearsing with the stunt department and came up on the idea of um, attaching an iPhone to uh, Logan, the the lead of that film. And basically, if he gets hit or throws a punch or falls to the ground, the roll of the camera would roll with him live in camera um, with the, using the Omega AR rig that AJ would be wearing. Mm. And uh, it... Felt, it felt very motivated in that film to do that because mm. it was whenever the stem, the artificial intelligence would take over Gray's body, um, you know, it felt like a, a great visual technique to become in sync with him. And then when stem left his body, we would sort of return to more of a handheld or loose style. And um, as he gets more and more taken over by the AI in the film, we become more and more locked to him him and the camera becomes more and more uh controlled yeah that's definitely came through very nicely i, I remember thinking and uh, watching it that it um there was uh i yeah you really felt it you knew when that there was a difference between when he, it was him or when he was someone else something else was in control uh, no, that yep. worked great so with, with saying that did you do any uh, any approaches where you're I, I, probably because I've only seen The Invisible Man once, um, where it's, the camera work shifted or the lighting shifted to trying to enhance something towards the end of the film, like where, where when she's kind of getting the power back, like, in you know, in a way? Not particularly, yeah. Like, I'd like to say we had a visual arc throughout the film, but not particularly. Like, we tried to keep the camera work throughout it pretty uh, controlled and... Uh, very still, uh, you know, the more we shot in production and uh, the more we fell in love with dolly work and locked off shots and very, very controlled shots. And if anything, we were very influenced by the way the motion control robot moved as well. We loved how controlled the camera moves were on that. Um, you know, it reminds me of what I was inspired by something David Fincher said about uh, his work in Panic Room, which was, the camera moves as if it was preordained to be like that. Like he sort of doesn't like shooting handheld or steady cam work. He, uh, he just loves very, very controlled, composed camera work. Mm-hmm. And um, Lee and I love Fincher and we were, you know, trying to channel him in some ways in that film as well as, you know, a bit of Roger Deakins from Prisoners or Sicario as well. Like, you know, we did splash it with a little bit of handheld, uh, and some more frenetic steady cam work at times, but otherwise a lot of it's pretty, mm. yeah. Yeah, it felt very controlled. controlled. So working with Lee uh, for the second time, did you develop a bit of a shorthand where you could really knock out everything? So, I mean, 
obviously in, in pre-production you would have discussed a lot of things but even during that process did you find it that because you worked with him on upgrade you were able to much easier get your concepts and ideas out and and be a smoother you know working team yeah definitely yeah yeah definitely having worked with him on upgrade helped um already coming in with a shorthand already having a lot of trust from the director that you were going to deliver for them um you know, in Upgrade, I'd shot it. We shot that in Melbourne. In Invisible Man was in Sydney. Um, I love shooting in Sydney as well because I shoot most of my commercial work there, and I was able to bring on a lot of trusted collaborators. Um, you know, uh, Mick Leslie as my grip, and Matt Hoyle as my gaffer, Simon Williams first AC, and AJ, like I mentioned, steady cam operating. All these people I work with have worked with for many years, um, so I was quite proud to bring them in to the fold and. Um, have no excuses in a way. Like I have a, such a shorthand with those guys. Um, and, yeah, Lee and I spent, it's probably the best pre-production of any film I've done was on The Invisible Man. I had more pre than I'd ever had, you know, probably had, you know, nine weeks of pre-production officially mm. on The Invisible Man as well as some, you know, unofficial pre doing that with Lee beforehand where we just watch movies and talk about what the film is and, mm. And having that extra pre, um, yeah, sure, a lot of that pre, you're like looking for locations and you're in cars and vans together. But it also meant uh, Lee and I could photo board together a lot with stand-ins, go to the actual locations and photo board and um, uh, previs a lot of the, a lot of the key sequences in the film, um, make very specific documents about what the coverage would be you know, use software like Shop Designer mm. to do overhead maps um, of, of key sequences. You know, we shoot and cut sequences on just a Canon 5D to figure out what they are. Um, so it just meant we came into the shoot with a lot more armed, with a lot more uh, information and, and stronger ideas. Um, and that, that was great. That I, I feel like it's the best best pre i've done mm, yeah i think uh pre it's it's a funny thing because uh, there's a lot of people have said that you know pre is sort of been left behind in a way when i in my opinion it's like that's the number one thing you need for filmmaking you know having the most amount of pre because on the shoot you just want to knock it out and not be trying to think of uh, you know trying to reduce the amount of problems that will occur during the shoot as well so yeah, that's that's a beautiful luxury to have if you got it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, it's very important, as hard as it can be, because it is can be such a blank page, and mm. you're scratching your head some days about how we're going to solve this problem. But um, yeah, it's very important. I feel like all the things that people have responded to the most on Invisible Man uh, have been things that we nutted out in pre-production, and um, and that doesn't mean you can't improvise on the day, because we totally would if someone like Elizabeth Moss has a better idea about how to block a scene, great. Mm. But you've at least come in with a, with a solid idea. Um, and, yeah, a lot of scenes we did, you know, it might have been a page dialogue between two people in a room that we just went, you know what, let's just see what they do on the day. We'll figure that out. We don't need to imprint anything on that. Um, but much of the film, yeah, was we, we did some solid solid talking solid planning about everything it's like i always say to people you're going to be that many steps ahead so if you if you're on set and you have to take a few steps back well you're already that many steps ahead so it's fine um and you know, you're convincing people even like you know small productions sometimes you're trying to convince people and they don't see the value of it as much and once they once they're in the in the shit in filming then they realize oh holy crap i wish i'd done that <laughs> So that's yeah. that's the it's a little thing that people forget and yeah I I know like when it comes to the money people they don't want to spend money on crew doing pre production but you know like even camera tests like I've never had a chance to do that anymore um, you know unless it's on my own time which I that's what you end up doing but not yeah. actually officially on production go we want to try out these set of filters lenses whatever um, I don't yeah you don't get much of that. And during the shoot, did you have a, I guess, a surprising outcome that you you might have like you hoped for, or you weren't sure if it was going to come, you know, pay off? 
I'm not sure. Like maybe the that sequence outside the psychiatric ward where she escapes through the rain. Um, mm. I was so focused on the logistics of that scene and making sure we achieved all the shots and the coverage and the storytelling of it. I maybe didn't appreciate that it was for me was going to be one of the most the greatest looking scenes in that in the film. But I was really happy with it visually how it how it turned out. You know, rain and sodium vapor lights and fluoros everywhere mm. and you know she gets confronted by the invisible man in that scene I, I love the look of that scene um but um no, no nothing surprising me th- throughout that but it was just such a roller coaster of, of a shoot a marathon like it was a tough shoot long hours more than i'm used to on, on australian films you know we did a lot of overtime um and uh yeah, it was just like just trying to stay mentally fit and healthy throughout that to 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 make sure we were alert and creative throughout it. Yeah, how many how many days did you have to knock it out in? I think it was forty one days. Wow, yeah. for a visual effects film, yep. that's <laughs> it's pretty tough. Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. And the I suppose the, when you were in a, uh, the final cut, you saw the final cut. What was was there? things that you saw that, that worked really well that you, you weren't, you know, because you, you never know until you see that cut. Was there scenes that as you read the script and it came off as well on, the, on screen or was there things you felt they could have, like, or you, they would have adjusted obviously in the edit, but was there a particular scene that you might have gone, wow, that really paid off? Um, I guess it's when you first appreciate the director's, real vision when you see, start seeing that final cut you're like oh, okay now you start noticing all these subtle details throughout mm. it that you might not have um or the decisions an actor was making throughout the shoot that when you're that close to it you don't see it from a bird's eye view mm. I, i'm always amazed at how actors can sort of pull out and look at a bird's eye view of the film and have these arcs in mind and be planting seeds of performance throughout um so there's a lot of subtle things I notice. Um, but, uh, I mean, I was just really happy at the work that Lee and the editor Andy Canny had done on the film because mm. I found that they, they cut quite a few scenes out of the film and made it so much leaner and, uh, and it was so much better for it. You know, at first, you know, of course you're like, oh, man, we put so much work into this big city <laughs> exterior. Yeah. They cut out, but all the decisions they make are what's best for the film. And, um, you know, I've worked on about four feature films with Andy Canny before and I have a good relationship with him. We talk throughout production about what we need and what we're missing. And, um, you know, I, I love, Lee and Andy brought me into the fold a lot throughout the edit, which I'm really thankful for just to be involved. Cause as you know, sometimes DPs can be, thanks very much. You're mm. gone mm. when production finishes and directors move on. I kind of love, uh, being involved throughout and, um, you know, seeing early cuts of the film and, and uh, yeah, they're a great team, Lee and Andy, really good together. Yeah, well, that's – it's kind of nice. I mean, from like you were saying about bringing your whole team from Upgrade to this film and, and obviously other projects you work with some your team, you know, it's sort of like a, a family that you get to go again because, like, that's probably the one thing that, you know, you finish a big project – You've done so many hours and you do feel like you're kind of saying goodbye to your family members. So it is nice when you can come back together again and do another project. And, and I think yeah, as long as everyone um, doesn't expect it, but, you know, it's, it's that they appreciate that there's a chance again and you work with a crew like that, it, it's always an amazing t- team working because they're always thankful that, yeah, we get to make another cool movie. Absolutely. So at the end, uh, yeah, your film came out just before this uh, virus hit. Was it fairly well received? I mean, it's hard to say because I, I really liked it, but it's just my opinion. So, <laughs> Yeah, no, it did really well critically, commercially. I was really happy with it. It, it had about a good two to three weeks in uh-huh. theatres before um, COVID-19 shut theatres down. Um, in, it was a blessing and a curse in a way because... <laughs> We're very lucky we got in beforehand, but on the other hand, we would have made, you know, maybe twice as much money if if that didn't 
stop people going to theaters because audiences were trickling away on week two or three um, yeah. because of the virus. Um, and, you know, they've now done an early release on digital um, to try and capitalise the fact that people were still talking about it, yes. uh, which is which is great, very clever. Yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah, I really hope that it's, it still has a bit of a run after all this happens, with you know, like with digital, but, uh, you know, because so, I know I spoke to um, another director and he'd, um, he was lucky enough that Palace kind of picked it up and said, once this is all over, we'll do a screening. So they had a second chance. So you never know, right. may- maybe. <laughs> but at least you guys yeah. have had that period, which two to three weeks is as most you can ask for these days anyway in cinemas. So I guess you guys... Kind of. I mean, in the States, certainly on Australian film, yes. But mm. in the States, I think it could have lasted another few oh, weeks yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, and I wanted to move on to another project just to switch gears and, and something you've worked with. with. Um, I was quite surprised you uh, worked on two Beyonce clips. Um, I quite like mine. I thought that was really interesting with, oh, I don't know, I'm trying to think of the right sort of art term, but it sort of had that impre- impressionistic sort of style of visuals. Um, what was the, I guess, for you guys, how, how did that happen? How did you get involved? And I think uh, Pierre, the director, did he bring you on board or was it like, a, how, how did it all happen? Uh, I got a phone call late one night uh, from a producer I've worked with a lot before called Adrian Shapiro. Um, he's a good friend from Sydney and he was line producing uh, those two music videos uh, for, you know, international company was coming across to to shoot those videos for Beyonce and so he put me forward to that director uh I had a job interview on the phone with him and then you know it was like the next day or day later I'm on a plane to Sydney going to a Beyonce concert with him and kind of wrapped up in that world for a week it was it was crazy it was a crazy week or so um prepping them and then shooting them but that was a lot of fun I had a great time yeah, well, can, the good beauty of music clips is you can kind of have a bit of a play. Um, was Beyonce herself involved in, in the process of the conceptualizing during the sh- or before the shoot, or was it more just it was Pierre was given the? Yeah, I mean, she approved the treatment that Pierre pitched to her. Okay, um, and he is a fashion photographer from Belgium, and so it was interesting. His treatment was kind of like pitch it tear sheets out of Vogue and Harper's Bazaar and it wasn't necessarily a treatment the way you might be used to looking at it. Uh, it was more like here's a scene that he wants to do that was more like lighting reference in a way. Um, so it's quite interesting to interpret that into how we would shoot it. Mm. Um, and, again, I had all that, that my sort of Sydney family on that shoot that I mentioned who I'd worked with on The Invisible Man. I had, you know, Mick and Matt and Simon and, um, you know, we shot it in Harry's studio in Marrickville and, um, yeah, it was, it was intense and stressful in a way because her people made kind of the atmosphere quite, mm-hmm. you know, tense. But, of yeah. course, once she came onto set, it almost felt like any other shoot. It was kind of casual. She was having input on stuff. It was, you were like, okay, this is just normal. Let's just get on with it. And, um I love shooting jobs like that, whether it's fashion or, you know, music video, um, music videos that look high fashion because I don't feel like we get to play in that world mm. enough in cinematography in Australia anyway. We've got a lot of incredible fashion photographers in Australia who work in that world, but in a motion picture sense, we don't get the opportunity to delve into that kind of high-end music video work much that I love to see on or used to love watching on Rage, or now watch on YouTube. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I wish I could do more of it. Yeah, well, hopefully opportunities come along, and you can probably start picking choosing in a way. And um, which brings me to another thing: like, as far as where you're at in your career now, do you have that opportunity to be a little bit more picky? Um, a little bit, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I read a, a few scripts a year and, you know, try and gravitate towards ones that I'm more emotionally connected to or ones that I might have a relationship with a director with, um, you know, you kind of take this 
broader holistic approach to whether the project's right for you. Um, you know, I've also got like a young family. I've got a five and a three year old kid. And um, so all every decision now comes with a lot more weight because, mm. you know, you spend a lot of time away from home when you do these long projects. Um, so you kind of weigh many, many things up when you're reading the script. Mm, so you, do you try to balance it with a bit more uh, s- smaller commercial work and then maybe do one film a year if, if, that, if that's plausible? Yeah, for a while there I was doing that. It was about one film a year, commercials around that, um, and that's a pretty healthy work-life balance. And But last year I, I did three feature films and a wow. couple of commercials around that and sort of flipped it the other way. Um, and that that was pretty intense. I was away from home for maybe eight months of the year at least. Mm. Uh, that was tough on family life. Trying to find that balance, and that's where it's a it's it's a really hard decision. I wanted to talk a little bit about the industry itself. Like your, I guess you've got your feet in Hollywood a little bit, but you're still quite strongly, uh, you know, situated in the Australian market. Um, well, with this virus, it's who knows what's going to happen. Um, but outside of that, like, how do you feel the Australian industry is at the moment with, you know, doing original works or films um, in that, you know, in that nature where we're trying to do something unique, but people aren't seeing those films. So, you know, how do you feel about all the Australian industry speci- specifically? Yeah, I mean, before COVID-19, I felt like it was pretty healthy. Um, you know, we generate a lot of incredible filmmakers and we've got amazing crews and it felt like we were starting to attract, once again, larger productions like Marvel and, you know, in Sydney and Queensland, some pretty big Marvel productions taking place there. Um, but, yeah, just that theatrical distribution model is still needs to evolve somehow because I feel like it's been broken in the country for many years. I've worked on so many films now that have had tiny, you know, one or two week releases where the general public would not even know these Australian films in theatres because they have almost no marketing budget to create public awareness for these films. Mm. And uh, that's, you know, it's quite heartbreaking because directors and crews work on these films for so many years to then have no audience. It feels quite, uh, quite a broken system in a way. Um, it's almost like working on a, you know, an art installation. Um, but so, so I hope someone smarter than me can figure out a way to revitalize the distribution of, of, of our content or, Find, the, find a way to get the word out to more people when these films are, films are out. Um, but because I feel like the quality is there and, mm. um, you know, our filmmaking talent is there, but we just, need, we just need better PR in a way. Like, Yeah, that's the big thing. Uh, I spoke with uh, Sue Maslin a few weeks ago and, yeah, she, you know, she said that's the biggest probably one of the biggest failures of Aussie producers is they don't actually realise that that part of it, the marketing part. You know, either they don't put money away for it or they don't actually begin that marketing process actually before the film's even finished, you know, like even before shooting. Um, There's a lot of that, I think, that lacks. Uh, You know, myself, because I've run a video production business, you know, that's a a strong element. So that's that's, that's a bit of a failure both from a production point of view, but also like obviously the support systems that we have, it seems to be like we'll give you money to make the film, but then that's it. Um, when it maybe needs to be, you go raise the money, but we'll help you get the film out. Might be a, a you know a switch that I, I I could see that could work too. Um, so yeah, because I, I you did uh, Judy and Punch, and like yeah, that film I don't you know I did, I couldn't even see it at the cinemas, like it was. I don't even know if yeah, it came. Yeah, it had a release, but um, as as the main, most Australian films, pretty small release, you yeah. know, like it was out for like two or three weeks. Um, you know, it was, of course, all over my all my social media feeds. Yeah. They probably figured 
something out that I was a part of it, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure if it would have been in any mainstream media in a, in a way. And uh, but um, yeah, it, it's tough. I mean, these distributors don't make a lot of money off those films, so they don't want to invest a lot of money in the marketing of it. Um, you know, it, I, I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, a crowded, it's a crowded market. We're going up against Marvel. Mm. tentpole films and franchises and um and it's not a uniquely australian problem either we might think Mm. it is but it it happens all over the world french films struggle to go up against marvel films italian films Mm. same thing like every country struggles for their independent cinema to to make noise yeah i mean um, in france at least they have a quota system in the cinemas i don't know about totally Uh, Yeah, uh, I think they do have a quota for streaming that's stronger than Australians anyway. Like, we don't have one at all, uh, which I think is a real mistake. I feel Mm. like we should definitely be implementing quotas for, uh, you know, Netflix, Amazon, Stan. I mean, Stan are at least much Mm. more supportive of Australian productions. They're funding a lot of Australian productions, but Netflix almost nothing. So, Mm. um, you know, compared to the amount of money Australians are spending on that network, like... Yeah, uh, I don't understand why, you know, our our government doesn't implement small quotas to be able to get to support the industry. Yeah, yeah, and Netflix is a bit unfortunate. Like, yeah, right, I know I was part of a few projects where they were trying to get them to green light and oh. and so with uh, talking about the saturation market of Marvel films. On the other hand. One thing that is interesting, that especially in Australia, the big problem, and probably, are, well, I don't know about other countries, but definitely some countries, is that we have a lot of film students, and they they basically can't, you know, they come out, do their three year diploma, whatever, and then at the end, they've got no jobs. Like they, you know, they think that they can get work in the film industry. So how do you, for your, from your perspective, I know you're a bit further down your career, but how do you actually stand out? among everyone else to try and you know to keep getting your gigs because you you probably still have to hustle just because you've made these films you probably still have to do that yeah um i mean the only advice i can give is what i did which was what worked for me was and it and it's not very attractive financially because i just volunteered a lot and i worked for free a lot Mm. um you know, I was working other jobs to support that by doing, you know, paid graphic design work or storyboard work or whatever while I was shooting student films and short films. But I felt if I just shot enough work that was of a quality and of an aesthetic that I wanted to get more of, then that would lead on to more of the same. And it, and it ultimately did, like, by even self-generating projects or, you know, shooting my own camera tests in a way that I could cut into these little videos. I thought if I could shop them around to directors I admired, um, they would they would appreciate what I might be possible of, of doing. So mm. I would say um, early in your career, focus on uh, trying to shoot and, and be a part of projects that you're really passionate about and that suit your aesthetic, um, that's really your opportunity to cement a, um, an aesthetic and, and, um, and experiment and explore. And uh, ambition's good, but also enjoy yourself that mm. time of your life as well. Travel, experience life, le- you know, study, learn more. Um, because you know, I, once things get busy, you might not have an opportunity to do to be as experimental and playful. So use that early part of your career to to fall in love with it. Mm. Yeah, definitely. It, um, one thing uh, f- from my perspective, I've had a bit of life experience, and I think that's a big key thing um, to round you as a person, as a creative, but also you know dealing with people because film shooting isn't you just sitting there lighting you have to actually work with a lot of other people and communicate and do all those things so i think life experience can and interacting with a lot of other people i think helps you to to be a better filmmaker as well um that's that's my personal sort of 
experience and view on it, but absolutely communication's massive as as cinematographers like so much of what we do is about communication to all levels of crew um you know so, so it's such a small part of your job actually physically holding the camera and lighting and all that stuff it's all hugely important but for a film like the invisible man most of my job is being a good communicator and um being able to translate what the director wants to a crew, mm. uh, being able to translate to producers and, um, you know, production managers about how we're going to achieve something. A lot of people forget, or not forget, but it, our the role of a DP is actually quite sort of, you know, a, lot, a fine line between creative and very technical. Um, and in saying that there are DPs that aren't that technical, but they still have to be able to communicate very specifically you know, what lamps, what, you know, everything gear-wise, um, but also have that creative convergence. You're there like a translator for that, for the director in a way, you know, unless you're, yep. da- unless you're David Fincher. <laughs> yeah. And so do you have any sort of um, future goals where you, you'd really like to be able to either work with someone or a, a type of story or, or even a book that you've read? Is there something that you'd really like to one day get to shoot? Well, I've always loved science fiction, so, um, you know, I'd like to be more involved with science fiction work. But um, ultimately, I I just want to be attached to good stories, good directors. Um, I'm not super attached to a genre. Like, you know, I would love to shoot a drama as much as, you know, I'd like to shoot a thriller or fantasy film, science fiction film. but, you know, I'd like to do more international work. Like I've, I've shot a lot in Australia. I'd love to shoot, you know, a film in Europe, UK, USA. Like I would love to, to start shooting more international features. So hopefully once, you know, the coronavirus has settled down and we all get on top of it, um, things will start happening again. But that's always been an ambition of mine. I love, I love travel. Mm. Um, so I can't wait to get back into that again. Nice. And do you do you have a projects any any that's well I'm assuming if the corona didn't have hit that's something that's waiting for you to get started. Well, I was on pre-production on a uh, a TV series in Toronto, Canada. Um, we did three weeks of pre-production, and then we the project got cancelled a month ago, as everything did. Mm. Um, so I'm hoping. You know, if everything gets back on track, I might be able to get back onto that series again, but uh, you never know. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I know it's all speculation, but it makes me wonder if there's going to be a bit of a crazy free-for-all because there's no content being produced right now. So what happens when everything goes back? Are people are just going to go nuts. I don't know. With, with, I don't know. Yeah, with production, <laughs> I just don't no. know. There is a lot of content on available though, so I yeah. feel like that's one thing I've been doing in my newly spare time, catching up on the massive amount of film and TV that yeah. I've never seen that people keep telling me you have to see. <laughs> so I'm slowly getting through that huge back catalogue. Yeah, that's true. Well, at least we can catch up with everything. Um, yeah, I, I finally got to see the um, uh, Chernobyl. Everyone's been talking about that. So. Yeah. Same. I just watched that like two weeks ago and yeah. uh, I loved it. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. And, uh, well, you, you've kind of trapped yourself. You love science fiction. So what is your favourite film that you just love to watch over and over again? And I guess why? Um, when I was younger, I, you know, I used to watch Fire Club and Seven a lot. I was, a, you know, very Fincher obsessed. But I've got to say I haven't watched Fire Club for a while. Uh, what One... One thing that always surprises me about Fight Club whenever I rewatch it is how funny it is. Mm. And it's and, and then maybe when I first saw it when I was 18, I maybe took it a you know, I probably found it funny, but I definitely took the themes a lot more seriously. But now when I watch it, it's kind of laugh out loud many moments in it. And and I appreciate now why David Fincher called us calls it a dark comedy. Mm. Um so yeah, I, I love I love the craft of that film too. It's so beautifully shot. Like, I, I love the work that Fincher was doing when he was on thirty five mil. Like mm. you know, the stuff that he shoots now on red is great, but 
um, yeah, Fight Club and Seven are just oozing with texture. Mm, yeah, beautiful. And that was both Darius, Kanji, both of them? Uh, no, Darius shot um, Seven, I know that. Seven and Jeff Cronenworth ah, yes, yes. Uh, shot Fight Club. Yeah, because yeah. they, they had that similar tone, but I guess that Link is David Fincher. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, that's a fantastic film. Yeah, it's it's funny you say that because I was very much the same. I saw it. Um, oh, I can't remember what age I was, but yeah, it was. Um, you, yeah, you do kind of take it a little bit seriously initially, and and in a way, I kind of probably didn't get it. I loved it, and I didn't know why I loved it. Uh, and then yeah, down the track, you watch it later. But then uh, on the other hand, I saw uh, Clockwork Orange. They had a rescreening. Back in the late nineties, and my filmmaker friend called me a sick bastard because I I laughed at the jokes. Like the it's a it's a <laughs> yeah. dark comedy, very very yeah, dark yeah. comedy. But I laughed at it, so I don't know. But yeah. yeah, that was another one of those films where you could really take it. Well, it's it's very uh, topics in it, are very, yeah, very complex and very dark in it. So you don't know if you should laugh. And you know, same with. Um, Fight Club, you know, there is themes in it that you're like, should I be laughing here? <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, great stuff. Well, that was uh, wonderful to have you on the podcast. I really enjoyed you sharing uh, a lot of details about your latest film, The Invisible Man, and uh, all the best for the future. I hope, yeah, after the vi- virus uh, lockdowns are done, you're back in business and you can get going with the rest of your projects. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Peter. Pleasure. Well, that was a great chat with Stefan. And, uh, yeah, check out Invisible Man and some of his other work, uh, especially Upgrade. It's one of my favorite films of uh, the ones he's shot. And, uh, yeah, next week, pretty exciting for me, uh, great hero of mine. It's uh, I'm having Don McAlpine talk to us and uh, talk about his career, his last career. So it will be interesting to try and narrow it down to a few things, but should be a fantastic chat with him and really look forward to sharing with you that next week. So look out for it.